Good evening and welcome to all listeners across Alaska and the United States. You are watching the cultural programs with the Morris Thompson Cultural Visitor Center, Tanana Chiefs Conference, and Danakanaga. I am Sharon Hildebrand. Tonight's presentation is traditional values for today's world, native values, how they help shape our native organizations. And also, thanks to our major sponsor, Doyon Limited. And during the evening, you can find more shows on the Morris Thompson website. And if you feel compelled to support this type of programming, there are links on there that show you how you can share and donate to the program as well. I'm Sharon Hildebrand of Nulato. I'm the Village Outreach Liaison for Doyon Limited. And uh, we have a great show for you this evening. We have respected leaders, Georgiana Lincoln and Steve Guinness. This evening's topic will focus on 21st century challenges, timeless values, how traditional values shape today's solutions. Good evening, Georgiana and Steve. Good evening. So Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself before we get started? Well, uh, my name is Steve Guinness. Uh, Currently, I'm the executive director of the Fairbanks Neva Association, and I'm also the uh, traditional chief of my uh, uh, tribe in Fort Yukon, uh, Alaska. And um, I've been involved uh, in advocacy uh, among our people for since 1974. Excellent. Happy to see you this evening and. Uh, grab you away from elections that are going on at the tribal hall or over at the West Fork right now. <laughs> Good evening, Georgiana. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, I am, uh, let's see, 40 some years on the Doyon board. I, I don't even remember exactly how many, but it's over 40. Uh, I am from Rampart and I um, am a subsistence fisherwoman. And I, the, I was the first uh, Alaska Native woman uh, senator, uh, sadly so, uh, and still uh, in 19, um, and in 2021, I can still say that. And I'm not uh, proud to say that. I'm, uh, I feel very sad that in here we are, in 2021 and haven't had a, a native woman senator uh, for the state of Alaska since then. And I'm retired. But you're still busier than ever, right? Absolutely. When people find out I'm retired, they say, oh, you've got all that time now. <laughs> 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 You're just telling us of your adventures and uh, getting into tornado land all the way from Rampart, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad both of you are able to join us this evening with your busy, busy schedules. We greatly appreciate it. So I'll get started with the first question. Um, Georgiana, I know that you're both esteemed Native leaders. What prompted you to become involved in the Native community and become a leader? What values played a role in that? I think I heard all of what you said, Sharon. I'm gonna take a stab at it. If I didn't answer that your question, uh, repeat it again. But really how I got involved in uh, 19, uh, Oh gosh, it was 63. Um, uh, Pauline Carlo, the late Pauline Carlo, kept asking me to come down to the meetings that FNA had. They had just started the organization. And I said, no, 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 no. Well, then she, she just persisted. And I decided I would go and try and find out what it was all about. And when I went to that meeting, um, there were just a handful of us, maybe 12 people that uh, started FNA. And we were talking about the same things that we talk about today. Um, 
sadly so. Education, uh, justice, uh, subsistence, employment, uh, and on and on. And so I became very involved in that because when I left Rampart in 1951 uh, to come to Fairbanks, I saw the discrimination that we had terrible discrimination in 1970, uh, excuse me, 1951 and on, on beyond that. Uh, still today, we have a lot of that. And I decided I wanted to be involved in making the changes for the better, betterment of our native people. Wow, amazing. Thank you, Georgiana. Steve, we understand that you're involved with our community and um, you were just telling me earlier how you've been involved with uh, Doi Unlimited as well. What prompted you to become involved with the native community and become a leader? What, what values, what native values played a role in where you're at today? Well, you know, I, uh... You know, I was fortunate to have been born during a time that most of our uh, elders were still with us. And uh, I was born in 1950. And so um, I think uh, with our elders present during that time, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, they were really the uh, backbone of the community. And uh, people listened to them. And so I was fortunate uh, to be, to be um, uh, educated uh, by many of the elders, not just in Fort Yukon, but the surrounding villages as well. But I think my whole uh, uh, advocacy started when I was in uh, uh, high school, in my junior year, uh, going to school in Fort Yukon. Um, one of the things they did was they had, they wanted us to participate in the meetings in the community, like the tribal council meeting or the city council meeting. And um, so we would go there and listen to, uh, you know, their reports and some of the issues they were talking about. Uh, in addition to that, I was also the school uh, editor of our newspaper, our new. Uh, school newsletter. And um, so I would uh, write in those, uh, my opinion about different things going on in the community. And uh, not only that, we also had uh, mock elections uh, among the students. Uh, when there's a presidential election going on, we would have a Republican and Democratic uh, party. And uh, we would go into the library at the school there and look through uh, like the uh, Time magazine and stuff like this, uh, where we would uh, kind of learn about the uh, kind of the uh, issues of the day. And uh, we would debate that uh, in front of our classmates. And we had elections and um, we had an election. And uh, me and my friend, uh, we won the Democratic uh, <laughs> Party. So I think uh, that that uh, kind of uh, uh, got my interest. And um, not only that, but uh, the elders always talked about uh, uh, doing what you can uh, uh, to help the people, uh, care about the people, respect them. Uh, those kind of values were, uh, uh, we, we were taught. So I think at an early age, I, uh, I was very fortunate in that way. Wow. Thank you, Steve. You, uh, you proved a point because studies have shown that when youth get involved early on, they uh, continue to stay involved with voting and elections throughout their lifetime. So um, thank you for those stories, both of you. It's, uh, it's very uh, humbling to listen to your stories and hearing the beginnings and such. You know, um, looking back at the early days when the organizations were first being formed, what Native values 
played a major role in establishing the agencies that you were involved with. Why don't you go ahead and start first, Steve? Well, you know, uh, of course, I wasn't involved in any uh, of the creations uh, of the uh, uh, organizations that's uh, here in Fairbanks, Fair Fairbanks Native Association and uh, Ten Chiefs and those uh, Doyon. Uh, but I do work at uh, FNA, and I've been their executive director now for 12 years. And, you know, I, I uh, learned uh, about some of the history of it, uh, uh, when it started, uh, some of the people that were involved in it, uh, things of that nature. And what I gather from that, uh, it's just like what Georgiana was just saying a little while ago, the... Um, there was uh, racism was well and alive back in that time. And social justice was something that was vitally important um, at that, that time. And um, so uh, I think one of the uh, purposes behind FNA is to rep have an organization that represented the native population here in Fairbanks. And, and so uh, it evolved into this, what it is today. Um, as I understand it, the beginning of FNA, they had uh, bake sales and things like this to try to help uh, uh, keep the organization going and you know, things like this. That's a very humble beginning for, for this organization. And it's been there over 50 years now, uh, a nonprofit uh, like F and A, and there's not very many uh, uh, organizations that last that long, but I attribute that to the uh, uh, the strong leadership uh, over the years, um, and it's still evolving. You know, we've got younger generation uh, of uh, board members and so so forth, well educated board of directors. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's really a testament to how uh, our people have been able to adapt and uh, learn uh, and, and uh, change with time. Beautiful. Georgiana, you know, looking back on the days, the early days of when the organizations were first being formed, what native values played a major role in establishing these agencies and companies to where we are today? Well, I'm going to speak in general terms because uh, representing uh, or on the Doyon board is a little bit different than being, say, on TCC board or on a nonprofit. But uh, Doyon, uh, we still feel, whether it's profit or nonprofit, it, as Steve said, the elders, we honor our elders uh, in our organization. We share, uh, that's something that's very important, that uh, we care for one another in our cultural and our heritage, we carry on our traditions, we, we carry on just because we are the profit making arm doesn't mean that we don't care about the same things that our sister organizations uh, care about and the uh, nonprofits. There's also, I think, uh, along with the elders, uh, family is so important to us. And when we talk about family, it might not be just our immediate family, it's our extended family, uh, whether it's a village or whether it's an individual or we always uh, say auntie or uncle, or I, I don't know how many kids call me auntie and they're actually not a blood relation. And I, I love it when I hear that, that's just a show of respect um, to one another. But also we, um, in the Doyon now, for example, we share in our seven eye 
the minerals that we extract from the land is shareable amongst all 12 organizations. We write letters of support uh, for uh, our sister organizations and uh, we always try and help uh, people, our own native people are, especially on education, uh, to grow and to pull them along and to help them to take over where we left off. Uh, and I think that the most important thing is you never forget where you came from. You always remember who you are. You're not better than the next person. And you always remember that where, where you came from. Mm, beautiful. While you're talking, I uh, recalled you visiting the Nulato Gymnasium when I was um, in grade school. And I remember seeing you with your entourage, but you're so beautiful. You know, you you spoke with the students and um, I was so proud of you. Uh, I think I actually wrote a poem about you back when I was in school. <laughs> I <read it. laughs> yeah, well, thank, nice. you. thank you. Thank um, you. I bet you traveled all over the state. All over the state. And I loved it. 14 years. Beautiful. And also listening to you, Steve, I uh, I was just recalling some of the things that you had shared with us with um, um, Grandma Paldine and how she had told shared stories with you about the beginnings. I, I'm sure you have a lot of great stories about her and uh, the beginnings of... Uh, she called you son, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular story you'd like to share? Well, you know, it's uh, mostly uh, what she shared with me was really a lot around uh, respect for our culture, respect for our, uh, our lands and our resources, um, um, our language, uh, things of that nature. And... Um, I really related to her because I heard a lot of that uh, as I was growing up. And, uh, you know, um, in my household uh, in Fort Yukon, when I was growing up, uh, we spoke uh, just Kuchin language. We didn't speak English in the household. Uh, the only place I would speak English would be in the classroom. So, um, so I could I could really relate to a lot of uh, what she was uh, uh, talking to me about, and um, it's always good to uh, hear an elder basically uh, reinforce that those uh, beliefs of our uh, of our people. Beautiful, and that uh, makes me uh, think about you too, Georgiana, and seeing you in the boardroom with our beloved, respected uh, elder, Pauline Carlo. She, you, you guys had had many, many years, and she was always seen in the boardroom. And uh, you guys would often be seen at other meetings and such. Uh, would you like to share any memory in particular with uh, respected late elder Pauline Carlo? Well, I. <clears throat> several things I, I i think the the very first thing i remember is uh she was telling this woman um my my best friend she called her in, in uh her language and i asked her what that meant and she said it was my good friend my best friend and i said well how come you never call me that and she said because i'd call you daughter Mm -hmm. And it just made me feel so good and so ashamed to even be asking her that. Um, and another time when she and I had uh, a room together uh, for Danakanaka, and I told her, I said, now go get your coffee, or if you want to, don't worry about waking me up, because she'll get up about five o'clock. And... So I woke up and I looked over at her and she was, let's see if I can show my arm. She was, oh, let's see, where am I? Uh, 
she was going like this and went way up and way up like that. And I thought something was wrong. And I said, Pauline, what's wrong? And she said, oh, nothing. I'm told I should do these exercises in the morning. So I do the exercise for myself in the morning. <laughs> and I, but you know, another thing, Steve reminded me, uh, my grandmother uh, couldn't read or write or, and she only spoke her language and uh, a little bit in English. And um, I always went back to her cabin in Rampart and uh, she put, she told me to put my head on her lap and she'd uh, talk to me in Indian or sing a song. And I always, it was just a comfort uh, that uh, I don't know how to describe it. And um, one time I was at the University of Alaska in Anchorage talking to the native students there. And this one girl, I didn't know, I had my moose skin vest on. She came up to me and she said, oh, she hugged me and she said, could I smell you? And I knew exactly what she meant because when I think about my grandmother, I can smell her more than I can see her because she used to tan moose hides all the time. She was tanning moose hides and I could just smell that sweet smell Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> oh. ah, thank you both for sharing such beautiful memories. <laughs> I had some laughter too. I'm I'm tearing up a little bit over here. Um, <laughs> can, is there other? Um, I was thinking about. Um, you know, there was a lot of challenges back in the day. Do you, Do you recall? Um, what what was some of the challenges that happened back in the day that um, your values helped get you through? How about starting with you, Georgiana? Well, I, I think uh, Steve would probably agree with this. I don't know what year he started either, but it was either 71 or 73 that I... Uh, I mean, 73 or 76, I began in Doyon. And we always, I, I always wanted to help. And when I got on the board, you know, I thought I just knew it all. Well, it's different. And I, I uh, many, many times we made mistakes because we were all in that same boat at that early beginnings. We didn't know, some of us, most of us, didn't know business as business. And we tried to fold in too much of the nonprofits. And even to this day, it's difficult to um, have profit uh, and protect our land and our resources. And we're all wanting the protection of our subsistence rights. Uh, and sometimes that butts heads against what we're doing. And uh, uh, profit making, I think, was, it's, it, I remembered, um, Sorry, I'm kind of jumping around. Uh, uh, oh, darn, I, I can't even remember that word now. But it was a word that was common. And I learned it at the Doyon board meeting, contiguous. Our lands having to be contiguous. And I had to ask, what was that? Mm -hmm. Contiguous. I didn't know that word. And uh, I think it's difficult when we talk about profits and we talk about dividends. Dividends was, were very foreign to us as dividend of making money. You maybe shared with what you got from the land with other people, but you didn't have the money. You weren't sharing that. 
and it's real difficult to explain. You had touched on uh, something earlier when you had talked about the seven I monies and how that had um, the native values had basically been rolled into how the seven I was created and how uh, native regional corporations share those mineral resources with others throughout the state, right? Correct. But then uh, there are those that feel that it's other regional corporations that feel it's unfair that now, after all these years, that why should we have to share with you? You haven't shared with us on the 7i. And it's, uh, it's one, like, uh, for example, uh, we had to share, we didn't have to, we shared with everybody in the village for fish and moose or whatever we got. But since freezers or electricity came to our villages, I see people now that have two freezers and where they would be a family that would have shared before are uh, uh, stocking up for lean times for their own family. And you can't blame them for doing that but it's, it's just kind of a foreign concept to us as Native people. Wow, that's uh, amazing in how far uh, we've come from those beginnings. Uh, Steve, mm -hmm. thinking back to um, how the organizations have grown and evolved, you know, thinking back to the beginnings and challenges, what are some of your native values that helped you get through those challenging times in the beginning? Well, you know, um, before I get to your question, um, I think about the, uh, the change uh, that our people have gone through. And, um, you know, for people that came off the land got caught up in the political system, got caught up in a monetary world, um, I think we've done very well. And I think what really guides that is the values uh, that we hold, we hold dearly, um, and that's the protection of the land, the per, uh, the uh, continued practice of our uh, culture, um, our uh, drumming and things of that nature, and hanging on to our language. Um, I think those is what has been able to uh, help us sustain uh, the rapid change that we were, uh, uh, our people were experiencing. And, you know, um, in the Yukon Flats, uh, at one point, there was a, a, the Rampart Dam was being proposed. And it really rallied not only the Yukon Flats people, but people from the, uh, all over the interior. Um, you know, they were proposing to submerge uh, uh, all of the lands out there in the Yukon Flats, our villages, uh, where our people had been uh, living for thousands of years and uh, living off the land there. And um, uh, so I think, um, you know, uh, things like that, when things like that happen, it really brings our people uh, together. Um, subsistence, uh, the whole fight over our uh, way of life. They call it subsistence, I call it our way of life. That's an ongoing uh, battle that don't seem to end. And we're being challenged big time today with a decline in our fishery. Uh, there's a prediction this year that we'll probably most likely won't be able to fish for king salmon. Um, you know, those are very uh, disheartening uh, and it cripples our, uh, our culture where Part of uh, fishing is taking your family out, uh, teaching the younger generation 
how to process uh, fish and uh, things of that nature. Um, so, you know, the challenges are there, but I think uh, our people are much more educated today. I think they understand uh, how to work within the uh, political system. And we're making some headway, and, but we're not winning every every challenge we're confronted with, but uh, we're uh, because we begin to educate ourselves about these uh, monetary world and the political process, um, I think our voices uh, uh, will become stronger as time goes on. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Wow. I, I'm, uh, I'm so, um, I'm so enthralled in listening to you guys' stories. Um, you know, uh, we have some listeners and uh, watchers that are online. I'd just like to recognize you for those who are watching online, and uh, we appreciate you um, tuning in. And we actually had a donation to the programming just a little while ago. Thank you, Linda. Um, and if you'd like to ask any questions, you can um, type into the chat and I'll ask them here. If you could tell me your name and where you're from. And um, yeah, so feel free to chat and ask any questions. We're talking about native values and we have respected leaders here in the interior and throughout the state. It's Georgiana Lincoln mm -hmm. and Steve Guinness. And, uh, they were both telling me how they were involved with uh, both organizations. Uh, Georgiana Lincoln, uh, did you want to tell me a little bit more about uh, how you were involved with the Fairbanks Native Association early on? Well, it, uh, I don't even know if I told us about uh, FNA to Steve, but uh, like I said, there were only about 12 of us or maybe, well, just a handful that really got started and we started uh, uh what steve was saying was uh, making money by selling sandwiches and uh soup and we'd make money that way and then uh, i remember every saturday selling the arts and crafts for the people and uh, f and a didn't charge anything in my time you know it was free and so uh, people had an outlet to sell the native arts and crafts. And then uh, we started at the Presbyterian church, um, and not church, Presbyterian home for girls uh, in the basement. And that's where we had our meetings. We didn't have any place, uh, permanent place. And then we moved to the Baha'i, Faith had a little place on First Avenue and they donated a space for us to have our meetings. And then from there we went, the first time we went to Fourth Avenue and it was in a basement. It used to be a bank and Clara um, Anderson uh, Johnson was the first president of FNA, a paid, we actually had a paid person and we're so proud of that. And I think there were two people that were employees. Then we uh, moved to uh, 102 Lacey Street. We, we don't even describe the building. We just say 102 Lacey Street. And I was a uh, executive director there in 19, late, early 1970s, late 1960s. And <clears throat> Uh, it was under the urban cities. Uh, they considered Fairbanks as one of the urban cities uh, for the urban uh, grants, mo uh, urban model grants. And then uh, in 102 Lacey Street, it was an old two-story uh, apartment building that was converted into the bedrooms became an office and the living room became the uh, front room of where you uh, where our administration staff was at 
uh, and we had there Fairbanks Native Association. We had TCC there. We had Dana at that time, Dana Hana Hanash. Uh, Tim Wallace was the president of that. So actually, we had a Doyon, FNA, and TCC all in one building. And we still had all this massive room uh, that we had a pool table. And we had ping pong tables that the kids came in and they played uh, ping pong. Uh, and our first social services uh, workers was Mabel Hobson and uh, oh, dear, uh, Steve, help me. Uh, hmm. I was hoping you could help me out here a little bit. And, uh, I forget her name, but uh, Mabel and we only had two social workers and uh, there was plenty of room, like I said, and we had more, we just, we were like a family. We all worked with one another then. And then from there, we, you look at it now and there in Anchorage, you can't go a mile without touching a building that is a profit, Arctic Slope, uh, Doyon, uh, same way with, with Fairbanks. There's a FNA, TCC has buildings all over Fairbanks and services. And in Anchorage, uh, then we got uh, AFN uh, that in the early days too. But I was thinking of <clears throat> the changes as we were going across country, the Indian uh, tribes that own casinos now. And in uh, this state, there were 160 casinos owned by tribes. And I looked at their land and their, uh, their land is a reservation but right next to it is high rises or ranches that goes on for miles. So the landscape has changed drastically in the landscape for the native people in Alaska has changed drastically. Subsistence is our number one priority uh, and that's undisputed. I don't know if we'll ever get that back, but we have to be involved in the pol political scene. And we are to much more of a degree now because of technology has changed. We have fax machines, we have computers, we have telephones. Uh, you could go on and on about the technology that has changed uh, and it's changing in our villages as well. Wow, thank you for sharing that, Georgiana. I go on and on, but it's just, it, you could, I'm sure Steve could take up this whole hour and I could take up two whole hours. <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, he can, uh, he can attest that our meetings go very late into the evenings because uh, we do a lot of talking. <laughs> so full disclosure, I'm also on the board of directors for uh, a Fairbanks Native Association, and uh, I work a lot with Steve. Um, Steve, in, uh, you, you had shared something earlier as well with regards to, um, you were on the DOI Unlimited board of directors, right? How, how was that early on? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I want to talk about that, to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, but seriously, you know, when I uh, got on the board, we were dealing with a huge deficit. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to really get too much into that, but uh, it was quite an experience for me. And, you know, I, when I ran for the Doyon board, uh, I really had a lot of misconceptions about it. 
And I soon, soon learned, once I got on the board, that the perception I had of it wasn't accurate. And uh, so it was me looking at uh, Doyang from the outside, looking in. And um, so that's one thing I learned uh, over the years is uh, uh, it's easy to look at any organization from the outside and uh, have a perception about it, which may or may not be accurate. And uh, uh, so uh, I've learned uh, over the years that if I want to learn about uh, specifically what it is and what they do, uh, that the only way for me to do that is get elected and uh, get on the board or something like this and, and, and really learn about it as much as I can and educate myself about it as much as I can and try to, um, you know, offer up my uh, understanding uh, and, you know, try to suggest change or whatever. Um, but that's something I learned through uh, my own experience. It's, uh, uh, like I say, it's very easy for one to look at an organization from outside in and uh, and then once you get in there, you find out that hey, you know, this is a lot different than what I what I was my perception was. Now, uh, you talk about values earlier, and I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, um, I think a lot of our uh, native organizations, um, I'm sure they have. Uh, a core set of values uh, that their board of directors identify. And in F&A's case, it's uh, respect, compassion, family and community, and integ integrity. And uh, those are the values that my board of directors uh, um, identify as the core values under which we we uh, operate at uh, F and A, and you know, um, uh, with my staff, uh, I always tell them that I'm not trying to impose my cultural beliefs on you people, but I want you all to understand understand it uh, to the best of their uh, ability, uh, so that when we're talking about caring for people, when we talk about compassion for people, uh, when we're talking about respect of our elders, uh, respect of our land, our resources, things like this, uh, they can at least have some idea uh, of what we're talking about here. And I think it's a, it's a valuable thing uh, to try to uh, educate uh, the non-natives that work within uh, F and A, um, I think that the the better understand they they have of it, uh, the better job I believe they can do, you know. And so I think each uh, uh, organization, whether you're talking about Doyon or Ten the Chiefs or the Nakanaga or the Interior Regional Housing Authority. Uh, I'm sure they all operate under a, a set of values, core values. And uh, it's something that uh, I think when we do that, we need to take it to heart and not try uh, not do anything to violate uh, what we set out uh, that governs our, uh, our, uh, our organization, you know. I think it's vitally important. And I also believe that it's vitally important that people that work throughout these entities uh, uh, understand that as well. Um, you know, um, you know, like I was saying earlier, uh, when I was growing up, we spoke our language all the time, day in and day out, you know. 
Um, through that, I'm able to communicate with our elders uh, and uh, fully understand what they're saying to me. Um, one thing that folks may not understand about language is that at least in a Cochin language, if I was speaking to you in Cochin and you understood it's uh, and understood it, it's a direct language. So if I was talking to you in Cochin right now, you all ain't gonna say to me, what do you mean by that? You know, it's a direct language uh, as opposed to English, which is uh, open to interpretation. Uh, I may be saying something to you, all of you, that uh, you may be interpreting in a different way than what I'm really meaning, you know? But in our Cochin language, though, it's not like that. So when, when an elder is speaking to me in, in our language, uh, you know, uh, there's no question about what that individual is saying to me, you know. Uh, but there's also with our elders, um, they say things to you in such a way that it's, it's, it's up to you to try to uh, uh, understand what it is they're saying, you know? Um, and I've heard a lot of our elders that uh, in the Yukon Flats talk to me. And um, later on in life, I, I, I say to myself, oh, okay, now that's what that elder was talking about. You know, it, it, it comes to me. Maybe not there, right then and there, but later on in my life, uh, it, uh, uh, I can understand then what it is that they were, they were saying to us. So I think values, uh, language, understanding of our culture, uh, where you come from, uh, all that is what makes us who we are, you know, and we should never ever uh, lose that, no matter where you live or where, uh, wherever you are in this world, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's really my belief and that's how I, uh, uh, you know, kind of conduct myself, right, uh, uh, among, um, among the people. Thank you, Steve. Georgiana, you know, thinking back to when uh, the organizations had first uh, begun and uh, thinking back to where we are today, uh, especially now, and where um, Doyon is today from where it first began, um, what are some of the values that have, play, have come into play? Um, is there any recollect recollections you'd like to share with us this evening? on that growth that happened? Was that a question for me? Yes, Georgia, oh, sorry. <laughs> First, I want to apologize. I drew a blank. Grandma Hannah Solomon was my second social worker. So both Hannah and uh, Mrs. Hobson was the two social workers that we had at FNA. And I, I just drew a blank, I'm sorry. Well, I, I think uh, there's a lot of things. There, there's a big change uh, since 1971, uh, the land claims, I think it was probably 20 amendments that have been made thus far on um, the ANSCA, the act itself, uh, and we'll see more. Uh, but one of the things that I remember early on was we had to approve, the Doyon board had to approve of the village corporation's expenditures. If they wanted to invest in something, they had to come to the Doyon board and they had to ask our permission to buy into that company. Well, I remember one time, uh, Jonathan Solomon, he came to our board and he had this uh, investment that he wanted uh, his village corporation to go into. 
And we talked about it for hours and hours and hours. And we decided as a board that that wasn't a good investment. Now, how we came to the conclusion that we knew better, the best for Fort Yukon than they did. But we made that decision. I remember him standing up and he must have lectured us for about an hour and <laughs> on why we shouldn't be the ones to uh, decide for the investment. So that's one of, the, one of the earliest things that changed that the village corporation, or not corporations, but yeah, the village corporation had uh, the authority to decide for themselves what they should invest in. I think that there's been a number of changes. We started out with nine directors and now we have 13. Um, there's been discussion about uh, what is a blood quantum for a native people. Should it be this or that? And um, there's also been discussion on uh, how how we should approach an investment. And we, we've always said that it's shareholder higher. And for our doyon drilling, we have upwards to 53% uh, doyon shareholders. But to me, that's not enough. We, we own the company. We should have more, but uh, there's give and take on our customers uh, on what uh, they get to decide too. Uh, I don't think uh, so much as the how we interact with each other at the board table. We do it. I think about respect that every everybody isn't going to vote the same and we're all individuals and we should respect that and um when you talk to a, an individual who disagrees with uh, things that we've said or done uh it should be done with respect it should be done uh without getting angry at one another. And I think that's, uh, overall we've grown from not knowing business to now we do know business. We own the businesses. Um, and that the, the sister organizations, we've got to find a way that our non-native, or excuse me, our non-profit and a profit can do so much more together they, than they can do apart. Uh, I'd like to see before my time is up that we do a lot more in being partners in helping one another so that's about it. Very good. Thank you for sharing those recollections of the beginnings. Um, we're nearing the uh, time of our closing time. We have five more minutes, but I wanted to uh, just ask both of you if you had any final words for our listeners out there. You had shared a lot of information from the beginnings of FNA with selling sandwiches to um, <laughs> Doyon Limited beginning in the early days, uh, all being in the same building, uh, f and &A and TCC and Doyon, we're all in the same building. I didn't know that. Playing pool. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Steve, uh, what's, do you have any final words for our listeners out there that are listening in terms of how values have helped shape our organizations and how they continue to guide you today? 
Well, I guess in closing, I would just, uh, uh, you know, say to the people out there, our uh, Native brothers and sisters, um, don't ever forget where where you you came from. Uh, we all came from powerful uh, Native families, each and every one of us. And that's something that will sustain you through whatever challenges that might come at you, is that uh, that Native blood you have in, in you. And um, uh, something to be very proud of. And if you all kind of look back at your own history, you'll see how uh, our elders from the past has blazed this trail for us that we're, we're on, on the path right now on. And so I always reflect back on that, the hardships they went through in order for us to have the land we have today and uh, the, the, all the different things we're doing uh, on behalf of our people. Beautiful, Steve. Uh, Georgian, any final words of um, the values of how they shaped uh, who you are and where we are today? Well, in the final words, I want to say to the young people that please, please uh, find a mentor. And I've been a mentor to many young people. Uh, it's just, it's someone who you trust in, someone who's not going to tell stories about you or repeat what you said, uh, but will help you to become who you want to be. Um, I had one mentor, and that was Morris Thompson. Uh, and I'm sorry now that I only had one because it's important that you have a number of mentors uh, to help you along. And if you, if you, I'm sure Steve mentors a lot of people too. And if you don't take advantage of that, if you don't just call up and say, uh, Georgiana, I heard you and I'd like for you to be my mentor. And what are you gonna do to be my mentor? Don't be afraid to ask. I think people appreciate uh, you asking and especially for mentorship that I would be the one that would be proud to be a mentor, not the other way around. And I'm sure Steve has done that for a lot of people too. So that's what my final message would be and get involved. It's easy to get involved. Beautiful. Thank you both so much. Uh, I loved every bit of this. It was uh, very touching. And um, thank you for the stories of reminiscing. Uh, I want to thank you both for sharing those stories. And I want to also thank all our listeners and viewers out there tuning in. Thank you to Doi Unlimited for their generous support so that we can continue to put together these programs that are on the Morris Thompson, or at the Morris Thompson Cultural and Visitors Center. And we also want to thank them, along with Danakanaga and Tanana Chiefs Conference, for putting together the programming. I'm Sharon Hildebrand. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good night. Good night, Sharon. <laughs>